Tomorrow Pictures. The story is in the telling. Do you know who I am? Who are you? I do. This is your Radio Almanac, the first of a new series. TV. It is most commonly referred to as the underground cinema. As of late, certain segments have assumed an era of propriety and call themselves the independent cinema. Others fall back on the old standard term avant-garde film, or simply experimental movies. In any case, it's come on very strong in recent years. There are several small theaters dedicated to showing these works, and presently, the most popular artist making these films, and surely the most provocative, is Andy Warhol. I am Cal Green of The Critical People, and I'm going to talk to Andy Warhol about his films, particularly The Chelsea Girls, one of his major pieces. In addition, three, five people, four people who have been associated with Warhol and his work will join in the discussion. Henry Gelzala, Associate Curator of American Painting and Sculpture at the Metropolitan Museum, Ingrid Superstar and International Velvet, both superstars who appear in Chelsea Girls and other of uh, Warhol's projected epics, and Paul Morrissey, film critic. Well, first of all, I'd like to get some background here. Uh, you first came on the scene as a painter. I remember the uh, Janus Gallery exhibit of New Realists in 1962. It's now called Pop Art, and uh, with a I'd like to know is what led you to make films from there or were you making films before then? I mean, do you think it's a natural outgrowth of painting or? Uh... Oh, Ingrid, give me the answer. <laughs> <laughs> the question's a little too above my head. <laughs> uh, Andy's, Andy's paintings were involved with newspaper images and television images and it was very natural to take those as stills and move from there into something filmic, something that moved through time. Well, uh, Henry, you 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 feel that uh, that painting, uh, rather film, then is like painting only uh, time in, has been added. In Andy's in Andy's case, I think, yeah. And the difference is that in the silkscreen paintings, he took other people's images. He took popular images from the magazines and the newspapers and where he found them. And this way, with the films that he's making, he's creating his own images. I see. Did you know that's the superstar? Mm -hmm. Yes, now I know it. <laughs> please repeat it. <laughs> oh, now Henry has to talk for both of us. <laughs> Before, it was just for me. Well, you can speak for me also. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, look, I mentioned that your works were provocative, which actually is a, a piece of understatement. You know, really, they're highly controversial. Uh, just to uh, roughly go into your earlier works, they included uh, such films as Eat, Sleep, Empire, Haircut. In Sleep, you stationed a camera uh, for six hours, was it, on a man sleeping? Eight hours on a stockbroker sleeping. Oh, <laughs> eight hours, excuse me. In Empire, uh, your uh, static camera uh, faced the Empire State Building for eight hours, was that also? I believe so. Well, <laughs> uh, Jack Kroll in uh, Newsweek, uh, when he was interviewing Chelsea Girls, uh, referred to these, uh, he called them anti-movies. He says uh, they had such an outrageous anti-logic of children, nutty children. They asked with idiotic re relevance, primitive questions, in a time where whose sophistication is simply another form of insanity. Uh, I think the problem there is, is very clear that uh, Jack Crow, who was formerly a, a critic with Art News and now heads the back of the book section of Newsweek, was very brave indeed to publish a two-page favorable review of Chelsea Girls in Newsweek. But I think he couldn't go out wholeheartedly for it, so he had to make it sound a little bit as if it was... Uh, Less, uh, less serious. Yeah, he had to have reservations. Well, uh, the reservations, you see, uh, it's possible he did have these reservations quite sincerely. Oh, it's, oh, yeah. it's very possible. But I think, I think Newsweek couldn't c really come out. I think the film is antisocial enough that Newsweek 
couldn't come out wholeheartedly for it. As much to the left of Time Magazine as Newsweek is. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, even the uh, World Journal Tribune uh, had a review of uh, Chelsea Girls, and Richard Goldstein, also referring to mm -hmm. the early films, called them elaborate jokes. Uh, for the most part, many people have uh, refused to take a great deal of your work seriously. They don't even uh, become uh, outraged at your extremism. I mean, uh, when he, when Goldstein even goes on to talk about the Chelsea Girls, he says either it's uh, dead serious or the most involved put on since uh, Orson Welles roamed the airways. Now, uh, the real question I'm trying to drive out with all this, uh, really, is are you putting us on, or are you trying uh, quite sincerely to make us see something of relevance, really something of importance? The accusation of put on charlatanism, or uh, are you pulling the wool over our eyes, has existed for the last hundred years in Western art, and it's always been uh, it's always been proved five or ten years later that the people who were accusing the uh, artists of charlatanism were people who weren't ready to look, and there hasn't been a single documented case of honest to God charlatanism by a uh, by an artist. So I think it's about time that aspect of the problem has been dropped once and for all. Uh -huh. Then, you, then there, there's no doubt about the sincerity of, of Andy's work. Ah, gush. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me not to say that. We say it. Mm, gush. Say it again. <laughs> Dinkleberries? <laughs> I want to know if Ingrid is putting us on. Yeah, Ingrid, are you putting, are you us, putting, on? putting you us on? Putting on? No, I'm my real self. <laughs> Sometimes I'm putting you on. When? When you don't want me to. Yeah. <laughs> Did you learn a new word today? Hmm? No, I haven't. Tell me a new word. Yes, Henry. When I first met Andy in 1960, he asked me to teach him a new fact every day, so that in ten years he could have conversations. <laughs> I, I tried it for about a week, but I couldn't remember them. Why can't you remember them, Andy? You remembered Gush. What <laughs> <laughs> a fact. Uh, hello? Hello? I think the idea of, of questioning sincerity is, is questioning intention, and the thing we're really interested in is results. And if, if Andy's sincerity and intentions aren't built into Chelsea Girls and aren't obvious, then uh, I just think it's, it's rude and over-provocative to go behind the film to the artist and say, are oh, you putting this on? Well, I think that a lot of people consider it a put-on uh, because, well, for one thing, they're not, let's assume here the sincerity of the artist, as you say, they're not attuned to watching it. They're not attuned to seeing this sort of thing. They come no, they're not attuned to questioning themselves either. No. They come to a film with certain presumptions. In fact, they come to just about everything with certain presumptions, mm -hmm. any kind of art, except painting. Painting, uh, so many people have been prepared to suspend disbelief <laughs> over the uh, That's very years. Recent. Yes. It's a very recent development. That you can get people to walk in to an art gallery mm -hmm. and look at uh, fire hydrants just torn right out of the street and placed on a pedestal. And they'll nod, uh, afraid to, uh, they'll nod solemnly, afraid to laugh. <laughs> I don't know, but we're, th those aren't people we should be discussing. I mean, th those people... No, they're not at all. Those people have very little relevance. They're yes, right. well, you see, these criticisms not only come from uh, the bastions of popular culture or middle-brow presumptions about art, if you want to call it middle-brow. Uh, take, for example, uh, Jack Smith, who is uh, a figure uh, controversial in his own right, he uh, made uh, Flaming Creatures, the that film. He made Normal Love, too. Oh, he, Jack Smith yeah. is so great. He's a great, yeah. great filmmaker. Well, he and feels... He's a great person. <laughs> and I yeah. sort of he's a real cam. He's a great star. <laughs> he is. He's, he's a good actor. He's a what? He's a very good actor. He's a cam. He is not. Mm. No. Yeah. How can I you say that? Is Ingrid wrong? <laughs> anyway, what are you going to say about Jack Smith? Well, his, he was asked in, a, uh, in uh, Dick Preston's uh, review for uh, the East Village Other to comment on uh, Chelsea Girls, and generally he said about the films, that uh, Andy's films, he said there's nothing underneath. He himself, that is Andy, has been terribly bruised by commercialism. He's the product of 
unarrested commercial intrusion into our daily lives. His films are not much different from all the plaster that's showing on 42nd Street. His main contribution lies in the truth of his soundtrack, which underlines the phony nature of the commercial film. But there's still nothing underneath. But then he goes on to say, and yet in the long run, uh, he may be doing something good for the medium. Uh, I, think, I, I think the uh, difference there is that Jack Smith has a totally different attitude toward filmmaking. He choreographs things much more uh, elaborately. He sets things up. He, he, wants a, he wants a predetermined look, and he gets it, and it's very beautiful. But Andy's approach is much more casual, much more uh, intimate, and things happen as they do, so that there's really a conflict between two different kinds of artistic yeah. intelligence here. Mm -hmm. I think they both admire each other's work, and I'm sure they do. Well, what I, uh, what I considered from his statement that he thought that Andy's work was uh, primarily uh, a kind of a negative value. It's clearing the air. It's sort of breaking down conventions. He's painting the ceiling at uh, uh, Cinematheque right what, now. What color? Psychedelic. Well, it's white. <laughs> right, but I mean, right now. What's he going to paint? I don't know. Psychedelic colors. Jack Smith. Yeah. Is He's painting the ceiling. Is we, I should be helping him. <laughs> it's terrible. He was With the brush. Yes, he's doing it all by himself. He he's probably getting paid. Like, no, he isn't. They can pay. They can afford. Oh, can Miss Velvet say a few words? You should. Her ask voice me. is so pretty. Miss <laughs> Velvet, few say a few words. Few words. Few words. Hello, this is me. <laughs> oh, no, use your voice. Use your voice. Uh, uh, this is what the movie's about. I think the people in the movie. Oh, get yeah. more information out of them. Well, yes, then let's talk about Did you the see Chelsea the movie? Girls. Yes, I saw the Chelsea Girls. I wouldn't be interviewing Andy about the Chelsea <laughs> Girls if I didn't see the Chelsea Girls. I would have. <laughs> <coughs> that might have been interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this uh, film, the Chelsea Girls, uh, packed them in at uh, Cinematheque. In fact, uh, there was a full page ad in the Village Voice uh, for it, uh, quoting. The uh, many critics, so including even uh, Dick Preston, who quoted Jack Smith as giving you, making bad comments about you. Uh, Preston himself was impressed with the uh, film. So were several other people. Uh, now, even uh, Archer Winston of the Post came to see it, and uh, whatever anyone might think about Archer Winston, at least. He came to see it. Oh, we have. And, uh, oh, we have two movies to make tonight. <laughs> we have to. Can you talk faster? <laughs> no, okay. We do. We, we really okay. Uh, yeah. What I'd like to know uh, right now is. Oh, we're making uh, uh, the, the the Edie Sedgwick story. And, Follies uh, at Tiger Moss. Follies at Tiger Moss. <laughs> in Tiger Moss's shop. Yeah. Oh, do you want to be in it, Henry? A little tiny bit. Okay, but you have to, you have to, you have to hum something. Mm. It's a musical. The Will Tiger Moss's shop is tiny. I can have room to make a film in there. Oh, oh we, we already have. We have, but we're really? just, yeah, yeah. Well, now we're making it a musical. But it it's didn't work. Fantastic. It was terrible. Let's <laughs> we'll see what it means. Oh, it's the remake. <laughs> uh, musical. I don't understand. If you're so casual about your filmmaking, why do you go? Why do you remake things? Why isn't everything perfect? Oh, well, no, no, it, it, it's not, not a remake, it's a musical this time, before oh. it was just... Uh, oh, I see, it's, just, it's the, it's the uh, version 30 years later. Follow yes. Up. Is this Edie Sedgwick here? Because you did an Edie Sedgwick. No, no, she's not in the... Yeah, she'll be in... She, well, we're having showgirls, she, she's going to be one of the showgirls in it. But then then later, after that movie, we're later on tonight, we're doing the Edie Sedgwick story. Again. Did you see Again? Paul the Rich Girl? No. You saw, he saw some film with Edie. I you saw Edie, Edie Sedgwick... Sedgwick uh, just, I believe, just making up, sitting on a bed, oh. and making up her face. Oh, yeah. oh, I forget uh, the that's name. That's Paul Richard. That was Paul Richard, yes. I, I didn't see the titles because there are none on your <laughs> films. Uh, <laughs> but about Chelsea Girls, uh, well, could you tell uh, the listeners what it's about? Chelsea Girls. Uh, sort of roughly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's about Chelsea girls. girls who live at the Chelsea. Not the Chelsea Hotel. No. In the no. neighborhood. In the no, neighborhood. But Chelsea, the name of the neighborhood is called yeah. the, like, the Gramercy when, Park. Yeah. <laughs> the Murray Hill. Uh, I've never been to the Chelsea Hotel. No. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> Neither have I, as a matter of fact. Really? No, I've never oh. been there. 
Neither have I. Except <laughs> once. But, but you know, in the advertisements, they... Oh, uh, I know everybody I was once. thinks... It's a very nice hotel. Everybody thinks uh, it's... John Kramer uh, about the Chelsea Hotel. <laughs> It isn't, but it said room 237, room 238, room this and room that. Oh, uh, well, I think that was the dead. ad writer taking liberty. I see. Yeah. The cinematic. I see. Well, the. the uh, I would love to see Chelsea movie. Girls in another theater. I always feel like an early Christian when I go to mm. the cinematic. And I've seen the film three times. I love it, but I really like to sit it comfortably mm. in a theater somewhere and see it as a movie instead of as a, a cult image in the cinematic. I, no, no matter how good the film is, you always have the memory of all your other experiences in the cinematic. Oh, but but, <laughs> but the place is painted white now. If they kept it white, yeah. it looks it's it elegant. looks so elegant. It looks like a new place, but they're going to paint it all different but colors. They should psychedelic it up then. <laughs> well, I know. If you, really, if you walk down and see it, Henry, it is so beautiful. I mean, it looks like it just it sparkles. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really does. Well, I mean, we call John and ask him to stop everything. Well, but uh, but uh, Jack Smith is doing it, Jack and it's it's, it's, it's and. Uh, <laughs> It looks blue and, a lot of magic blue and green. I'm sure. Well, it might be nice. It might be really. Uh, Aren't blue beautiful. and green his colors? Oh, like he this. has beautiful colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, Jack Smith's so great. Well, so the Chelsea girls are. Uh, Ingrid could tell you what it's about. What's it about, Ingrid? Well, it's about you know girls and boys. Uh, acting out <laughs> life, true, really true life experiences. It's very candid, and um, is it your true life story, Ingrid? Not really. Some of it. Some of I it. I thought is. you memorized the script for that, Ingrid. Oh, that one color movie. Well, we had uh, the script projected on the wall, and we had to read it. No, the, the other wall. one. Mm -hmm. Who wrote the script? Oh, um, that you forgot uh, all the words. <laughs> Well, that's uh, that brings it up. It was mostly ad libbed. Yeah, that brings movies. up a question. I'd like to know. Uh, mm. This is not only about Chelsea Girls, it's about most of your films. A certain dominant feature seems to be improvisation. Uh, oh well, no, it chance. isn't improvisation. It, it isn't. isn't. No. You actually plan these things out. Uh, yes. Well, is there a script? Yes, uh, for one of them. Well, <coughs> there was for one of them. Lots of good people that just uh, know what to say about it just, the right uh, thing. Well, it's just people who, who know how to act in front of a camera without looking at the camera. I see. You once... So I think they're, they're, that's the uh, difference. Yeah. It's... It's... Uh, the camera's uh, just uh, not there. The camera's invisible except it can see. Yeah. Well, you once mentioned that you thought your friends were so interesting, or the people you knew, that all you had to do was uh, turn a camera on them uh, yes. and let them go yeah. through their daily routines. The, this is not considered improvisation. Ah, uh, no. No, he chooses the people. He chooses the... Uh, he's behind the camera. Well, the, the kind of things that they do at uh, an actor studio is something, you know, they, they tell them to do something and then they make it up. Be a tree. But, but it isn't the same thing. Uh, Be a tree? <laughs> Oh, Ingrid, don't look at Henry that long. <laughs> Grish, say something, Ingrid. You didn't tell us one of your well, jokes. Well, somebody asked me a question. What part, oh, of in German. what part of the movie did you like the best? In The Chelsea Girls? Her the part. part that I ripped Susan's dress off oh. when she threw a, pi a pitcher of cold water over Why'd me. Why'd she throw a pitcher of cold water on you? I don't know, but she whispered something in Mary Warnoff's ear. And Mary might. Mary might. Mary might. No way, Hannah. <laughs> And um, I, you know, I knew they were plotting something about me. So uh, she, th I stood up when I saw her uh, pick up the pitcher of cold water, and How she do you threw know it. Was it. Cold? it was cold. It really felt cold. But you cold, lost your eyebrows in there. That's why you got mad. <laughs> I got mad because I lost all my makeup and I got all mad. Uh, your and eyebrows. Wet, and I threw there. her against the, the window. And you I threw me out in the fire escape. The window was open. Yeah. Well, you luckily the window was open. <laughs> 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 Why don't you start a fight here? Most gorgeous <laughs> New Jersey German you've ever heard in your life. She was born in a U-boat. Yes. Oh, don't listen to that. Oh, them it's them. true. She's a true <laughs> underground star. <laughs> <laughs> under the ground. <laughs> under the water. 
She's born in, during the war in a new boat <laughs> in, in East Hampton. We shouldn't say that on the air. Really? Yeah, well, they're only going to cut it out anyway. No, they better. You <laughs> said it. You gave it in, to, in your other Well, from you know. now on, I'm just going to sit here and I'm not going to say a word. <laughs> oh, Ingrid, you're oh, such Ingrid. a star. Well, you know. Pouting. You're shaking your nose won't do it, Ingrid. <laughs> <laughs> Ingrid? Come on, say something. This is radio. No, I won't say anything anymore. Oh, why not? If you're going to bust my chops and cut me down, I'm just not going to say anything anymore. Cut you down? So we have so a pretty good saying. idea of what the film's about. Yes, it's all arguments and fights. <laughs> yes. People bossing other people around. Yes. <laughs> there was a series of uh, very aggressive acts. Yeah. Who had the biggest balls in the movie, Ingrid? Yes, they were also ominous and foreboding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you were wearing... Who had the biggest, biggest earrings? earrings. Who had the biggest earrings? Biggest ball earrings. In the movie? Yeah. I don't know. Well, Susan, I, should, I guess. I should mention that Ingrid is now wearing uh, these gigantic ball earrings. Uh, they're designed uh, by my fiance. David Crowland. David Crowland. C R O L A N. The styrofoam balls covered with paraphernalia. Fifteen dollars. <laughs> the cover of Mademoiselle magazine. This is non-commercial hey, radio. This is, yeah, this is non-commercial radio now. Oh, you can't do that. Come oh, on, okay. gang. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, what I wanted to know is uh, something rather interesting here in several of your works, Hedy Lamar and that uh, poor little rich girl, and again in the Chelsea Where is Girls, it? you use a dual a dual projection. And uh, you use this all through the Chelsea Girls, shutting oh. off sound from one to the other. They, they two films alongside well, of each well other. Well, only because it could be a different movie any time you come and see it. Ingrid, put down that cigar. <laughs> no, it's Henry who's smoking the cigar. I don't. You don't even know cigars. Henry's last name. Henry Geltzower. <laughs> C-O-H-E-R. Oh, <laughs> oh, well, everything I always do is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be. <laughs> I think the, one it's of the most mistake. interesting technical things in Chelsea Girls is Andy's use of invented color, where the he shines a, a red light on the actor's head and a blue light on the wall behind him, so that it's a color film, but it's not the color of nature or found color, it's invented color. Yes, yeah, so was uh, the, the use of, uh, there was this color, uh, <coughs> there was this color, passage of color in the, uh, that was very, everybody was rather interested yeah. in We're that. We're shooting everything now in color. Everything mm -hmm. in color, but this kind of invented color. Mm. And, uh... It's very beautiful. Um, may I ask you a question? Yeah. What did you think of the Pope? You know, did you see a movie with the guy yes. sitting there as the a Pope? The junkie Pope, yeah. Yes. What did you think of that? Well, we're going to get around to what I generally <laughs> thought of it. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh because, well, what I wanted to really note here is uh, something else that a lot of the critics have mentioned, and it seems to be fairly consistent. When they uh, tried to explain your film, they said this was a peek into hell, you see, into the hell of contemporary society. Uh, and these people, uh, some of them uh, taking, uh, I think it was a fetamin uh, of some sort, injecting uh, mm -hmm. that kind mm -hmm. of fetamin, yeah. uh, uh, injecting uh, themselves with all sorts of things. There was also a great deal of homosexuality uh, portrayed and uh, some sadomasochism. Uh, my own impression, now we're going to get around to it, is that this couldn't have been a, a, a picture of hell. There was something very innocuous about it. There was something almost flippant about the entire film. Uh, for me, uh, William Burroughs' Naked Lunch is like a peek into hell. I wonder if you follow me. There was something very casual about this. Uh, sometimes I didn't even believe that these people were injecting themselves with anything. They were. <laughs> well, uh, well, whether they were or not is really beside the point here. The thing I'm talking about what comes across on the screen to me sitting there, well, they could have mm -hmm. really been everything they were uh, playing at or they weren't playing at or whatever it was. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't really think that. In fact, I thought that the film had this, as you mentioned before, this casual manner about it. And uh, hell is usually a rather intense thing, at least traditionally it's portrayed as intense, regardless of, uh, regardless of how extreme or how experimental or how uh, different the insight into hell might be. 
No. Well, Andy, Andy goes to church every Sunday. I think he probably has his own idea about hell. Chelsea girls remind you of hell? Uh, no. Were you surprised when critics wrote about that? Uh, yeah. Um, no, it's not surprising because it's, uh, it's a very old-fashioned, uh, corny literary idea. Well, people are idea, corny hell. because of the, uh, no, about reviews. And you, w when somebody, one person writes a review and the next person always seems to pick up something from the person before and then it just keeps going down the line. Well, each and reviewer reviews all the reviews review, of the And they never review what uh, <laughs> That's really true. Say, I can't really, you know, like, w somebody made a mistake and uh, that same mistake goes all the way through. So, I mean, it, it, it's just unbelievable. Well, this is old as art history. Vasari tells a story in the 16th century and everybody always repeats it from, now, from then mm. on. Because everybody goes back to what they call documents and first sources mm. and they aren't really that at all. So you feel that even in the good reviews, people haven't really really made a, a, a sincere attempt to follow your Well, all the girls are so beautiful. Nobody mentions that. Yeah, the girls are also beautiful. I mean, that's one of the most obvious points about the that's movie. The idea. And uh, somebody else comes up with the well, silly I notion that. of hell. <laughs> well, I noticed that. The guy I was with noticed that and pointed out... Uh, uh, I mean, every, everybody out. keeps saying, you know, <laughs> yeah. why, why didn't some of the girls take off their clothes? Well, <laughs> but uh, the whole point is... Um, they don't have to because they're beautiful. Somebody said that last night. Well, about three or four people mm. said it. Mm. You know, they're waiting for the... Um, the good part. The good part. Well, then let's get around to the girls. Um, <laughs> Miss Velvet, Miss Superstar, how does it feel to act in a Warhol movie? Or uh, do you call it acting at all? Oh, it's so true to life. <laughs> and it's not even acting. I mean, it's just so candid and... Like the camera isn't even there, like Andy said before. And uh, uh, the people, uh, <coughs> the people, does Andy call to you from off screen and tell you what to do? Or No, unfortunately, there is no direction whatsoever. <laughs> there isn't any direction whatsoever. We're just told sort of like a theme to stick to during the movie. It gets more extreme than that. We were making a movie the other night, and Edie Sedgwick said to Andy, as the cameras began to roll, what is this film about? And didn't say <laughs> yeah. a word, just got behind the camera and started zooming. I see. And we don't even know when the camera goes on, or when the camera is turned off. Or loaded. Or loaded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you edit? Uh, no, but I believe in editing. <laughs> Very good belief. That's, I think that's well put. <laughs> that's why I goes to church. <laughs> and that's cryptic enough. Myself. Do you ever reshoot? Uh, well, we don't have the money right now to reshoot. You want an angel? Mm. Oh, yes, we oh. want an angel. Or a fairy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have plenty of fairies. <laughs> <laughs> Gush. Gag. <laughs> Well, uh, let me just sort of toss <laughs> this one out now. Um, no, uh, the mothers, uh, we saw the mothers the other day, and they said yeah. they were, uh, they had just come in off the program here, and uh, in California, well, they, they can just move into a hotel, and they said something about, maybe I should, I don't know, they said something about, as soon as they know that the mothers have come into the hotel, they get all these girls, and here... Uh, the mothers? Would you explain the mothers, that? Mothers, the mothers of invention. invention. They're a group from San Francisco. Uh, and, and they're very good. A good rock and roll group. They're down oh. at the Dom right now. Three dollars. Oh, I forgot what the story's about. It's too complicated. What you do Uh, well, I want to... <laughs> Are we, are we all declared, <coughs> everybody? Uh, what do you think of commercial movies, uh, Hollywood movies, for oh, example? Oh, I just love them. Don't you, that, wouldn't you love to have all that slick technical equipment? Oh, you? yes. See, Andy, I, I used to say a couple of years ago when Andy was making Sleep and Eat that he was the Grandma Moses of movies. He was the primitive who was reinventing it and everything. And then he moved into sound, he moved from color into black and white, he moved from stills into, into motion and so on. And I think he's recapitulating, in a sense, the history of the, of the cinema. But a lot of the reasons for certain technical things that happen in the movies really is that he's working the, whatever money he's making on the paintings and sculpture going into the movies, and there really isn't any outside money coming in. It's expensive as hell to make movies. Oh, but I, you know, I, it's so funny. I was thinking about sound and. Um and when you go to a Hollywood movie, they have thousands of people talking, but you don't hear them talk, mm -hmm. and that's not fair. 
<laughs> no, I mean, you know, yeah, it really isn't. Well, when you go into a restaurant and, and the, so they have these two little people, <coughs> you only hear their voice and thousands of people with miles well, are moving. Well, my favorite thing in Hollywood movies is in, in the night when they turn off the light in the bedroom, it always gets brighter. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, in other words, if you remade the movie, all the incidental detail, if you made a Hollywood movie... Oh, no, 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 movie, no, I, no, I was thinking about it, and maybe uh, I like uh, the sound that we have. You like the sound. You know that in s sure. several points, well, the well, sound is impossible Well, that's only movies. because uh, in the kind of camera we use, uh, when you make a print, uh, it's a b bad print, but we get good sound. I mean, you know, hearable sound. Would another the would another theater have, have more audible no. sound? No, it's just, it's, it's uh -huh. in color pictures, uh, uh, when they make a print, they, they can't make the sound print mm. somehow, unless well, you use a different kind of a sound. Well, the thing that I noticed... And so mostly on the, on the, it was just in the color movie that the sound didn't come out. I see, yes. Well, what, I thought that was purposely done. Uh, in fact, the guy I saw this film well, with said you purposely portrayed this guy as some sort of a narcissistic jackass. Well, it, it should have built up. See, somebody has to be there to work the sound, and uh, and it would have worked that way if, if, if I worked there, because then I could put both sounds on, then it would sort of lead up to, you know, start slower and get bigger, and it would be more, uh, more like music than it would be sound, or something. <laughs> Oh, Miss Velvet, say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your yeah. voice is so beautiful. You really have no. to say something. You didn't, you didn't tell us, Miss Velvet, what you think about it. Oh, Miss Velvet, say something. <laughs> What's David doing tonight? Oh, he's making earrings. He, he is? Yeah, he's meeting us at Dog and Morris at oh. 9 o'clock. Oh. So we can't be late. S same ball earrings or different kinds? Oh, no, different kinds. Oh, what We're kind? designing new ones. Wolf. Oh, you magazine? know, the, the, the sequins that are... No, Where's Yeah, Hattie? they're for Tana Country. Where's Hetty? I was going to ask you the same. Do you, have a <laughs> <second>? <laughs> Do you have the strange feeling we're deteriorating? <laughs> oh, not at all. I thought we were what? getting better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's a little more at ease uh, now. Gush. <laughs> did you take an injection, Ingrid, just now? No. Is that what you did? Is that what you did? You're talking. Went under the table and Went came back. <laughs> oh, it's only acting. This is an Andy Warhol radio show. I don't know what you expect. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I actually... I, uh, this is I anticipated. <laughs> Uh, by the way, on, on the point of commercial movies, Hollywood movies, are there any particular filmmakers or particular oh, films you well, like? Well, I really love them all. All of them? Oh, yes, I really do. All of them? Yes. On the point of uh, theater for a moment, you were once asked what you thought of oh. Edward Albee's Tiny Alice, and you oh. said, uh, what oh, was Oh, no, I did like it. You said yes, you said it was very boring, and you like boring things. Uh, well, uh... Yeah, only because uh, somebody said something. Uh, Gerard uh, went to see uh, the African dancers, and he said it was. Uh, uh, he hated it because it was so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and he said it, it was, he really mm. did, and it was just. Uh, and I can understand that now when you, you know, uh, uh, see things where things are being done, and so much of it, that it really is. Uh, you hate it. Yeah. It's called un de richesse in French. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> too much of a good thing. <laughs> oh. Uh, das ist nicht gut in Deutsch. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's fabulous in German. Please, uh, Ingrid. <laughs> Look, uh, Speak your German listeners. By the way, what did you see Masculine Feminine, the uh, Gada film? Uh, no, not yet. Hmm. I thought you might be interested in that. Uh... Uh, did anyone here see that film at all? Well, I guess. Oh, we Henry saw it. Why'd you shake your head and say you didn't <laughs> see it? Yes. I saw so Pierre Le Fou. I didn't see Masculine Feminine. Well, really? What did you think of that? What's that? That's the other Godard film that What's was at the festival. Oh. Do you like it? Yeah. What's it called in English? Peter the Fool, I suppose. Really? Uh, do you have any particular films that you like? Um. Amongst Hollywood films? Uh, Any particular filmmakers? Do you try to use their techniques or emulate <laughs> them in any way? Edison. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the one I read. Oh. What movies like have Edison. we? What movies have we seen recently? Um, we saw some. Well, uh, name some. Oh, we Carpet Bags. Ecstasy yeah, and Me by Henry Moore. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, but I once read that Andy said he liked uh, <clears throat> Edison. That's a good Edison. Could, could I bought the Clockwork Orange today. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. Oh. 
Edison was uh, killed by uh, <laughs> by uh, techniques which he uh, refused to. Uh, was he a movie maker? Adopt, too? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he what had the Edison kill? studio as well. Like yeah. his films just didn't go on. They didn't. Uh, the new techniques were coming in. I think he lost interest in. in them. I guess he had other things to do. No, D. W. Griffith came in with new techniques oh. and new innovations, uh, and he didn't. But uh, he, was didn't he, he was interesting. He was interesting because he came into filmmaking from another field too. Who Edison? Um, yeah, he was a really? scientist. Oh. And he went in to make films, <coughs> and he had a very unusual approach oh. to them. And uh, in a way, it's comparable to Andy's if you think about it. Uh, the camera didn't move either. What, are there it's, any left? Uh, yeah, oh. yeah, they're very oh, famous, okay. some of them. And uh, wow. he was, uh, you know, he made them by himself, and I think he wrote them too. And then he stopped making them and went to other things. What do you think of television? Oh, t oh I love television. Aha. The commercials? Uh, no, I just love television. I think uh, movies are sort of finished as soon as television gets bigger. Really I mean, think bigger so. screen, yeah. I don't. Uh, I don't think so. Oh, I do. As I think it's a different medium. No, altogether. but as soon as the screen gets bigger, uh, there's no reason to go out. And you know, then then it has to be bigger and bigger outside. Something. There's social reasons for yeah, leaving but, the house. Yeah, but it would have to be better than bigger. I think it would have to be, you know, as clear as film. Where are you going to meet? Clarity of film is magnificent. Where can you meet people if you don't go to the movies? Oh, nobody ever meets at the movies. We always invite people <coughs> over to watch television. Though. You actually think that on this convex screen yeah. that just well, about no, no. kills yeah. oh. all contrast you can really oh well, it won't be on that screen it will be on the wall and you know when the wall gets as big as a movie screen there's uh, no re technical there's, reason I mean, now why why the uh, television screen at home isn't can't, they? can't project onto a wall i know but they'll never get the quality of a film and it it's another quality like it's a beautiful film. quality oh. well it's seen, a different thing it's like a newspaper print or it has a bad magazine the color i, I like think color. then films are a very delicate thing they have to be seen in a certain uh, context a project, dark projection room, at least, if not a big theater. Well, I think they'll improve the TV so it does reproduce film quality. Well, it's gonna, what's going to happen is there's not going to be two different things, one called uh, movies and one called television. There's going to be an industry that makes things for, to be viewed oh. on these on these big screens oh. at home. Yeah. And all, everybody's going to be making that instead of... The or, or unless, uh, you know, like more things will be happening in the movie house. Like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Shades of Fahrenheit, 451. Well, uh, change, change is terrifying. Uh, what do you think of uh, s other uh, experimental filmmakers? Oh, I, I like them all. <laughs> you like them all? Yeah, right? Alex here. <laughs> He's great. Is that his name? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> that, I mean... Piero Alex. Yeah, cool. Is it? No. Piero. Piero. And uh, 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 Harry Smith and Barbara Rubin. Oh, she's great. And Jonas Mikas and... Uh, Gregory Markopoulos. Gregory Markopoulos. And uh, Bruce Bailey. Uh, uh, I've never seen one of his films. Just remember the name. And, uh, and Are you influenced at all by these people? Oh. Uh, or do you follow your own path? Well, uh, they seem to be influenced by each other. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Andy and his work tends not to be influenced. I mean, if you go back to the sculpture and the painting, he uh, he comes at things and does them the way he wants to do them. And they don't end up <coughs> looking like anything else. I mean, it's not, he's not clearly in the mainstream of cause and effect and art history and so on. I see. Then, then you would say that when you do make a film, just about every convention of the film is actually broken down. A person walks into a movie house and it's projection room when he watches an Andy Warhol film mm. and he can't really bring anything with him from another film any presumptions anything else of that sort he just brings himself is that about it uh, I don't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> well people have certain presumptions about movies you know they feel that it should have a plot it should have acting in it it should have certain kinds of tempo, certain kinds of pacing. They feel there should be recognizable images. People are not prone to uh, appreciate uh, strobe lights flashing on them or on a screen, a blank screen. Uh, there's been uh, <coughs> a great deal of mixed uh, reaction to uh, films being projected on people. Uh, I just think you're saying that people are, are loathe to accept anything that's new and that uh, 
you know, I don't know why we keep <coughs> talking about these people who have such difficulty well, with, with dealing with. Uh, there is a point. There is a there is a value in communications. You realize no, that even well, the most um, sophisticated um, people. What I'm really interested in is uh, presumptions. working, uh, making movies for uh, young kids. And, uh, and young kids have fewer preconceptions, and and. Uh, no, uh, no, and the movies are going to be about young kids. They're going to be, you know, like. Uh, 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 people who are 20 are going to be playing 40-year-old roles, and kids who are 16 are going to be playing 30-year-old parts. You know, like uh, uh, somebody like Ingrid playing Jane Eyre. <laughs> <laughs> How old was Jane Eyre? Jane Eyre was very young. Was she? Oh. At the beginning. She was about 20, <laughs> 20 she got older. Well, I didn't oh. appreciate that remark very much, Andy. I think you owe me an apology. I'm not that old. I thought you were 28, Ingrid. No, I'm 21. You are? Yeah. When was your birthday? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you threw the party. You should know. <laughs> How old were you? I just said I was 21. Uh, Did you make a movie of that party, Andy? Uh, no. You missed your videotape machine. Wasn't that fun? Oh, yes. Wow. That was videotape fun. machine. Oh. Last year, uh, Andy had a machine where you'd have a party and for the first hour everybody would have the party and the second hour they'd sit and watch the first hour of the party on the machine. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Uh, this this uh, goes back I suppose to, uh, stop me if I'm wrong, to Jonas Mikas and uh, his home movie uh, eight millimeter thing that uh, if we get really down to basics there is art in the movies that uh, mom and pop take of the kids oh, on Sunday. Yeah. Well, he likes it. Oh, I wish they'd do that. You know, he, he asks everybody to send in movies from all over, and then they would show them. I was on a That'd radio program with Tom Hoping a couple of weeks ago, and I suggested that he give that 8mm cameras to kids in the park in the summer and just show oh. all the films they take. You know, just be fabulous. Yeah, some revere or something, well, give them the, the cameras. She's special gifted children from uh, music and art makers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then, uh, this is something like uh, the business of free expression with kids and painting. You know, they in, in school just give them a handful of watercolors and let them. Uh, yeah, but there's something about the recognizable image of a uh, what you see through a camera that's uh, a little bit more controlled than that. You know, it's controlled because it's recognizable, and it's it's controlled because uh, our sensibility is geared now to television and to movies and so on. So the kids grow up with some kind of built-in ideas about where they want to focus and what they want to look at, and maybe even an idea of what the result is going to look like, without even then knowing it. A kid who watches six, seven hours of television every day from the time he's two years old, by the time he's 12 or 14, put him behind the camera, and he's been trained to a certain extent. Well, this, would, this has always been so. If it hasn't been television, it's been some other uh, no, broad uh, popular cultural conditioning. But it certainly hasn't been true about, about painting. I mean. Uh, but the I manual think dexterity necessary to be a to be a painter is just something that, that doesn't doesn't come yet. There have been very few cases of child genius. Yeah, it did exist. But I think all films are very educative. You know, I just watched a film last night and I really was amazed how great it was. And it's a film looks silly now, but it was called The Best Years of Our Lives. Mm, you're sure too. And uh, I had never seen it, I always wanted to see it. And it was just such a great film. And, you know, it has as many false yeah. points in it, you know. But it was made to educate the people at the time. That's the whole point of the film, to mm -hmm. show the people what was happening. And anyway, Andy's films do that. They show people how people really are today. They, they're trying to show, <laughs> you know, the people that I exist in that year. <laughs> like, they were trying to show the people that exist in 1946, right after the war, engaged in all these problems. It was slightly sugar-coated, too. Right, I, but right now, they really off on that film and talk about it. So. It wasn't sugar-coated. It wasn't a sugarcoated film. Uh, it was a very hard, some realistic pretty film. pretty maudlin exploitation. It was maudlin, but that's not sugarcoated. Well, they showed the man with no arms, and that was very dramatic. But he happened to be a really excellent person they picked. And uh, right now, there really aren't great issues for people to get involved about. And if you do show someone involved in worrying about burning books, that's so ridiculous. Because how many people do you really know give a damn about that garbage? It's something that's really beside the point. They're manufacturing <coughs> an issue to get people concerned about. People aren't very concerned about issues now. So why not just show them uh, doing, uh, being not concerned? <laughs> well, so that's a, many scenes in Chelsea goes with people who have no concern. But that's the realistic uh, presentation of the people today. People, why you get concerned about something? There, there's very little, I mean, the government's employed. You hire people to take care of the uh, business of running the world. So people don't bother about that. That's well, what, you mean that then just simply holding up a mirror to the total apathy about you? It, it, some people would call it apathy, but it's also very interesting, too. 
You know, there's something interesting about it, even though it might not be engaged in very large social problems. But, well, it uh, says something, but it says something fairly, it says something uh, totally negative. I mean, even, it, no. there's no element of creativity involved here, well, surely it's a, is. It's a, creativity is, is selectivity, so it's all involved in that. And uh, oh. it depends on what you, uh, you know, if you don't find anything interesting or creative there, well then that's just... Uh, what's you know. a, what's a, recent, a recent film that's shown some creativity? I wanna, I'd like to understand what that is. Well, I had mentioned it before, and we couldn't discuss it. Masculine, feminine. I thought that, uh, and I thought a very tightly controlled film uh, that <coughs> showed at the festival, Oh Zah Balthazar, uh, was absolutely brilliant. And uh, not only was there control, it, it was so just so tightly knit, and the camera was so pointed in what it showed. It was a fascinating film. Did you see it? Ruben Brasso. It was busy. Robert Brasson's yeah. film, yeah. What was it was about? About the donkey? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it was a gigantic allegory, really. It was. I thought it was gigantic. I thought it had it had epic proportions far beyond but its. I don't modest understand. I don't understand making. about film because uh, everything you take is right and real. So why why mm. why everybody thinks that you have to waste Hollywood and anybody, even art movies. You know, you have you have. Like, I met one man, he said, I do 50 takes to one. <laughs> and that's, you know, I mean, really. Mm. And, well, and, and, uh... Well, would you why? say then, would you, you know, say, like, simply uh, say that everything that then, everything that's occurring is odd? What you have to do is record oh, well, it. Oh, we're not saying it's art. Do it, though. You it's, can uh, get engaged it's right. in it, though. It's not art. I mean, wh it's you know, right. It's right. What do you mean it's right? Well, the you're putting your cigarette out now is right. It's worth paying attention to. I mean, you're doing to. it, and you're being nervous, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's right. true. I mean, people I mean, aren't going to accept these elaborate allegories that people prepare and uh, lay out and then work towards, because it becomes very obvious that somebody's pushing something, you know? And you don't have to do that necessarily. It's and true. It's after, after being exposed to Andy's films for a couple of years, uh, standard Hollywood and European films look terribly labored. Mm. Uh, Pre-shaped, and uh, they look—they look like uh, film plays. But then mm. people sit in the windows and look out all day long mm. at people, and people with most. Yeah, we could go on for out. about two hours discussing this. Would you say then that simply uh, taking uh, taking a psychiatrist's notes and recording it, uh, while well, publishing them, would make a novel? Uh, yeah. If the person Andy, Andy can say that, but but it's not true because what the difference is that what we're seeing is all this that's going on through Andy's sensibility, mm. through Andy's choosing of the people that he surrounds himself with, through the way he views the camera, through the way he chooses the background that they're going to be in, and uh, in very subtle ways, <coughs> he, he shapes the way things are going to happen, but but uh -huh. not not in the direct, uh, you know, autocratic way of the traditional director. Mm. And I've been in uh, Klaus Oldenburg's happenings. And class almost never gives us any instructions, but he chooses our props, he chooses us and how we relate with each other, he chooses the space we're going to work in. And after eight or ten days, what you've got is something that looks like an Oldenburg. And it just does because of his projected personality without, with very few specific instructions. And Andy works the films in the same way. Well, re then regardless of how subtle or how different the control is, there is a control. I mean, there has to be some definition here, presumed definition, that when you you go to work to make a work of art, there has to be some control somewhere. Yeah, but oh. the, the point is to de-emphasize as much control as possible. You know, John Cage always says that uh, he, he theoretically would like chance to take over completely, but yet when the, Never when the piece is finished, it always you can tell it, it sounded like Cage, because at the last moment you can't quite give up all that control that he would want to. I think, I think it would be impossible <coughs> for him really, probably. Well, because everything he does has the same, you know, when Jackson Pollock threw the paint, it looked exactly like Pollock threw the paint. It's, it's just sort of, uh, you know, a larger uh, sensitive. Oh, another idea I had was that um, uh, I just read the thing about Montgomery Cliff and, and how he died and, and his image. Uh, uh, he had to get a new image and <coughs> because he had to. I mean, you know, his I, physical image changed. And, and, uh, and, you know, it was so terrible. And I think uh, 
Well, he was ill. There was a lot of extenuating circumstances. Oh, but I mean, but it's just the idea that you have to get a new image. You just have to, or, you know, like, uh, and John Wayne did it in his first movie, and therefore he's in Hollywood now, still longer, you know, longer, and, and still in movies. But I think people's lives are interesting in their fantasies. And so you can, uh, if somebody wants to be in movies, you can buy their life <coughs> and say, um, I, uh, you know, we'll do two movies of your life for that year, or three or four or five, depending on how interesting that person is. And therefore, they could stop in five years, like, if their life is interesting enough, they can go on forever, you know, uh, selling their uh, life. Who was the uh, uh, Italian uh, filmmaker, was it Olmi or Rossi, who said he feels that the perfect film or near-perfect film would be simply following a man around with a camera for 24 hours. You'd get a lot of back, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> what? Dish. You'd get a well, lot of back. Mm, yeah. He was only being <laughs> figurative as a spec. No, but that's what uh, Alan Funt always wanted to do also. Oh, I think Alan Funt is fan. <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> oh, please Just say fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> Who <laughs> was there? <laughs> fabulous. I don't know. Able to do. Able to do. That's so good Thank you Fabulous. for telling me. Take five. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, oh, anyway. Andy's films are... Oh, who said, well, well, when did this man say that? Oh, the Italians are the only ones comparable uh, a little bit, to, or at least modernistic in their films. They have at least new they ideas about They all use exactly films. the same grain film, though. They always use exactly the same. Oh, that's, that's uh, great. No, you know what? That's kind of the light of the country. But, I mean, a country like France turns out one chassis film after another, and I don't know what era they're working in. But uh, the Italians, uh, you do look to them for new ideas anyway. Well, I'd like to uh, know something about your plans for the future do you continue are you going to continue to make the this uh film a conventional projected film you seem to be working in mixed uh, media uh the velvet underground for one thing uh, lots Lou of Reed, music John <laughs> Kale, <laughs> no. Nico. Nico. Ari. Nico. Sterling, Ari. <laughs> they're making a musical about Ari. Are they really? Are going to be in it? No, no, it's, it's the Exodus. They're making it into a musical. Mm. And they're going to call it Ari. <laughs> 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 what did they get? No, no that's the name Ari. It's the name of the character in the Exodus. It's also the name of Nico's little five-year-old son. It <laughs> was named after the movie. The character <laughs> 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 no, the movie. blue eyes. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Oh, it's a good movie yesterday. What? Uh, Texas Across the River. It's so funny because well, you know, I've been that? watching uh, Dean television? Martin. No, no, I've been watching cartoons and television, you know, children's cartoons. And this one was exactly like a children's cartoon. It was supposed to be comical. It was comical, but it was so childishly yeah, was comical. Dean Martin and uh, Joey Joseph <laughs> and Alan Delon. Alan Delon. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was on. It was on. The, it was in the movies. You went to the movies? Yeah, it was oh. open yesterday. It was opening day. It was a very cute cartoon oh, really? movie, oh. you know, about bad guys. Why did you go see Alan Delon? Uh, I just thought it was nice for Thanksgiving. see. Wait, he's in this Paris burning. Yeah, I understand. It's a bomb. That's a very good director made that, but uh, he hasn't made a good movie in years. Who made that? Very good <laughs> He used to make all his movies about children, and then he the started making about grown-ups. Forbidden and now they're Games, changed. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then he made a lot of other good films. Walls of Malapaga. Yeah. It was a very great film. You, re you realize, though, the, this film you're talking about <laughs> was very tightly controlled, quote, labored, unquote. It's Paris Burning. Yeah. Uh, well, not only that, but even Forbidden Games, it was by written your by definition. Non-people. Non people. <laughs> <laughs> By your definition, it would come under the heading. Oh, this doesn't <coughs> does, doesn't deny the entire history of films and all. No, no, so no. I mean, it's just a question it's of making that kind now. of film in this day and age. I, I mean, those films made like uh, like the best years of our lives. He's a great genius, that man who made that. He, William he, Wyler. Yeah, that film, if you really think about it aesthetically, like, he's a very interesting... No no other country could have made that film. It's such a great film. Yet he's uh, Alsace-Lorraine Jewish, and he has a very strong accent to this day. And he made these great American films, yet that film could never have been made by anybody but somebody in America. Who's this America, we're talking about now? William Wyler, the director. Yet somehow... Uh, he he knows how to make a film like that, which is a very literal, realistic film. You know, where the camera sits back and it shows the tacky interiors of the people in the small town where they live. And there's no sort of elaborate uh, elaboration of uh, romanticizing of the people. 
it's really such a document that film yet uh, two three years later he made a very romantic film called the uh, the heiress you know with Montgomery Clift and, oh, like uh, which is so yeah. beautifully you know conceived and you know you know pointed yeah. in a certain direction but it's period it's a period piece and it's romantic and it's uh, everything else I but think, he, he's I think a very interesting man I think what's happened between the uh, early 50s and now that's made Andy's films possible and made our preparation for it is all the millions of hours of television viewing where you look rather casually yeah. at something at a box that's projecting an image in the room and you listen to the sound sometimes you go out and you have a beer and you come back and you pick up something a and you Pepsi. hear it and you Pepsi all oh, right no count but uh, <laughs> the sound Hot isn't cherry. all that important the, the image isn't all that important Hot it's just cherry. something that's going on I think maybe one of the subconscious reasons why Andy used two or even three projectors in Chelsea Girls was exactly the same thing. That one image really doesn't hold our, our interest because we're so used to having that one image going all the time. So let's make it a little more complex and let's look at two or three images or not. So everybody always wants to see what's on the other channel anyway. <laughs> well, anyway those, those, two, uh, those two images running alongside of each other, was that purely by chance or did you in Ten purposely to uh, juxtapose well, it's these. Still, it's still by chance now because uh, it uh, it just takes uh, uh, the money to make an effort to lock them in in some way or to yeah. coordinate them. But uh, things tend to work together by chance anyway. I, I've often thought that writing movie music must be terrific, and then one day I turned on the television without the sound and put on an opera, and I realized that no matter what happens in the music. It exactly is what going on, what's going on on the screen, and that writing movie music is just yeah. nothing in the world because the crescendos of the music and the crescendos of what you see are always together because you just do those things uh, automatically. Mm. So that no matter how the two films are running together, they're making points across each other. Oh, and everybody always says that I do these things, but I really don't. I always say we because um, so many people do it. And you know, it's like getting your Oscar. You say, <laughs> oh, yes. thank you, Billy <laughs> Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> And everybody, no, but uh, but uh, it's just it's so hard. I mean, it really is, and and everybody helps. And uh, <coughs> um, Billy spent a lot of time just, you know, I had my my version, which was longer, and uh, Billy, you know, spent some time over there and actually put his version. And so, I mean, I, he has a lot to do with the way it looks now. So, uh, well, tell me, what are your uh what are your plans for the future? Uh, uh, next to, media, or uh, just doing what we're doing? Just as as Chelsea girls. Uh, well, well, I don't know. Uh, every day is a new day. Yes. Yeah, you can just fall over and die. <laughs> How about um, painting? Are you going to paint? Uh, what? Well, Sometimes. Oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, the movies are really so great, and what we're doing is so really so exciting. But you wouldn't think of making a uh, movie very similar to your paintings, for example. How, how would that happen? I mean, how would mm. that look like? Well, the uh, so-called new realism, the straight photo of, oh, let's say, objects, uh, the, the famous Campbell soup can, uh, station a camera on that for several hours. Oh, it's <laughs> uh, well, much prettier. Well, but we, well, we did already with, uh, you know, with the Empire State Building. What do you? I don't know. Why would you? Why would you station the camera on the Empire State Building? Oh, it's not very the beautiful. Soup can. Well, they're both beautiful. Well, well. well the, Empire, the point of the Empire State Building film was that it, it went from uh, the setting of the sun to uh, turning on the lights of the building, then the turning it off, turning off the lights of the building, and turning on the lights on top. There was there was a progression of light. and an airplane going by, <laughs> <laughs> and the birds saw. flying. There were no birds. I heard there were. <laughs> <laughs> Who tells Somebody that had seen the movie <laughs> told me that they could see the birds flying no across birds. the building. Well, I for one am looking forward to the next film. I did. Uh, I did find. Well, what I really want to do is, is uh, I just think uh, uh, it really doesn't matter what movie you make because uh, you can make the same. Uh, if we had the same story, I'd just do it over and over again. Every man only has one movie to make. One movie to make. That's true, and the best directors always make the same film over and over again. Once they stop making the same film, the real hacks you can tell are people like Kubrick always make a different film. And when they stop making different films, you know they have no interest in making movies, really. they best off. I love Hammer films. What well, about? Yeah, they are. horror films are oh. so beautiful. Well, this can lead us into a totally new discussion in another hour. Uh, thank you. Uh, this has been Cal Green interviewing.
Andy Warhol on his films, particularly the Chelsea Girls. Miss Andy Warhol. <laughs> oh, the God. queen of pop art. <laughs> yeah. And uh, with us has been Henry Geldzella, the associate curator of American painting and sculpture at the Metropolitan Museum. Paul Morrissey and uh, uh, the film critic and last but not least no you forgot someone Ingrid Superstar <laughs> and International Velvet two film actresses who appear in Andy Warhol's movies <laughs> good English <laughs> <laughs> this is Tomorrow Pictures dot tv